nine o'clock. So let's begin. Now, today we're going to talk about well, any questions from last time that people want to mention right now. The raising your hand stuff works. So if you have a question anytime during the lecture, raise your hand and uh, something pops up here and tells me. Um, okay, so today, constrained optimization. And this is the point at which we can really start talking about doing serious economics problems. Um, now, here's a canonical problem in optimization. Minimize um, some objective function, then you have equality constraints and you have some inequality constraints. Uh, and we're assuming, of course, that all these things have enough smoothness so that uh, whatever we're doing is legitimate. General C3 certainly is adequate. C2 will generally be fine for algorithms working. Of course, maximization of utility subject to budget constraint. Optimal incentive contracts maximize the uh, profits of the owner subject to the proper incentives for the worker. Portfolio optimization, lifestyle consumption. Anyway, these are all examples we'll see a lot of. Um, now, we're going to start with the simplest such problem. Linear programming. Now, linear programming is not um, as commonly used now as it was, say, 40 plus years ago. Um, back when I was in graduate school, there was um, um, uh, a topic that was kind of dying out, but called activity analysis. And, um, and basically, it, it, th those were linear programming problems. Um, and those, and linear, because they're simpler and to do um, linear programming problems have been, people have been working on that uh, for a long time. In particular, um, during World War II, there was um, extended effort to uh, work on linear programming problems, basically to figure out how much steel, oil, et cetera, you have, can, can need in order to accomplish a certain set of outputs. Uh, given some uh, input requirements. So, uh, and then after World War II um, came uh, sort of an explosion in uh, methods for linear programming. And now, however, in economics, uh, we prefer using, uh, you know, smooth production functions, smooth utility functions, et cetera. Um, but, but linear programming is still important um, to know about in particular, well, it's it's becoming increasingly useful um, in um, the new big data analysis, where the um, some of the estimate some of the ways to estimate things is is via linear programming. So, also the thing about linear programming is that a lot of concepts can be illustrated there um, that are relevant elsewhere. Now, the canonical linear programming problem is this minimize um, the objective function, which is basically the inner, the inner product between some fixed vector A and then your choice vector X. Um, so it's a linear objective in X and then subject to um, CX equals B, where C is some known matrix, B is some known matrix. And so you have these inequality constraints, inequality constraints, and then you have the inequality constraint that X the choice variable has to be uh, greater than or equal to zero in each component. This is all component wise. Now, you might say, well, there's a lot of linear programming program problems that don't look like that. Well, the thing is that you can turn any linear programming problem, however you express it, into this form. So for example, if you have some matrix D and you want to impose the inequality constraints, DX is less than or equal to F, what you do is you introduce slack variables S, S has to be non-negative, and then you have the equality, dx plus S equals F. So then now you, you maximize over X and S, subject to X being non-negative and S being non-negative, and uh, then you get it into the form, this canonical form. Same thing for uh, imposing dx greater than or equal to F. Um, again, you create surplus variables, that uh, fill in the gap between 
dx and f and then can lead to another sort of equality constraint with the slack variables being constrained to be positive. Um, bounds on the variables also the same thing. You, um, so these, so this is a canonical, this is a canonical form. Um, and so uh, some software will force you to transform your problem into that form. Others will do the transformation for you. Um, so um, now the basic method in linear programming, uh, certainly the first very successful and widely used method is called the simplex method. And now here's the description of it. I'm just going to go to the picture um, since I wasn't able to get the picture on the same page as the text. So here is, uh, okay, the, the broken lines and arrows, that represents the uh, sort of ISO value lines for the objective. So we're trying to maximize some linear objective and that means that we're trying to go out to the uh, northeast. That's a, the higher plane we can get on, the better off we are. Now, what are these other things? Well, one of the constraints, basically a, a variable constraint on Y, says that uh, you have to be below this line. And then there's a constraint on X that says you have to be to the left of this vertical line. Then there's another constraint, um, probably something like X plus Y, less or equal something, says that you have to be inside here. Now, um, so the feasible region is really C, G, H, A, origin C. Now, how does the simplex method proceed? Well, first of all, you start with some point, one of these vertices. Now, by the way, the origin is a natural place to start because the origin is, um, in the canonical form, the origin is always feasible, um, but it's on the boundary. So we start there. And now then what the simplex algorithm does is it says, okay, there are two directions I can go. I can either go in this direction up towards C or in this direction towards A. And what the simplex algorithm does is say, which is the direction of fastest improvement? Now, in this case, if you're at the origin, the improvement is fastest in the direction towards C. So what you do is you go along this, uh, basically this constraint line, and you keep going until you hit um, the point C, which is where this other CD constraint binds. And so then, okay, you're there. And then you say, now, okay, what's the direction of fastest ascent? Well, now this is a degenerate two-dimensional two case, so there really is only one choice. But in higher dimensions, you come to a point like this, and then there might be multiple choices of which directions to go. You pick the, the um, uh, direction of most rapid um, as, uh, descent, or, as, yeah, and, or de ascent in this case, um, and then you go down that way, and so G, and then, oops, there's some other constraint binding, and so then you go down, um, and then you go down here, and you end up at H, which is a solution. So in, in some sense, this uh, linear programming is what we call a greedy algorithm. It's that, okay, wherever I am, I go in the direction of what is locally best. Um, I don't look at anything globally. I just say, okay, what direction is locally best? And by the way, simplex algorithm is generally going to have you go along the edges of the uh, simplex, which is defined by the constraints. Um, so that's, um, I'm not going to go into the details of simplex method. It's a headache. Um, I don't even know the details well. Uh, so um, I'm not going to go into them, but this is the idea of what they're doing, of what's going on inside the simplex method. Now, there's a nice history that goes along with the simplex method. Um, the origin of the simplex method is a paper by George Dantzig. Um, now, uh, some of you may be acquainted with the movie Goodwill Hunting, where the uh, story starts with some janitor goes into a math lecture hall, and he's about to erase the boards, and then he sees some problem. He starts working on the boards, right? He starts working on it, does it. Turns out it's an unsolved math problem, and so that impresses people. 
Well, George Danzig is an origin of that story because when he was a student, he was late to class one day. This is tells you, shows you why you should be on time. Late to class, he sees some problems up on the board. He thinks they're homework, goes and solves them, and then gives them to the professor. Uh, they weren't homework. They were really examples that the professor had put up there saying, these are unsolved problems in math. So that um, impressed everybody. And then that also laid the mathematical foundation for his later work on simplex method. Now, um, the thing about the simplex method is that it's a, it's a great example of how uh, the computer science con uh, concepts from complexity theory are really irrelevant. If you look at the standard base concepts of computer science uh, complexity theory, uh, they would say, well, the worst case time is exponential in the number of variables and constraints. That you can find that given any n, you can find some linear programming problem um, so with, when you have n variables plus constraints and you end up having to take a two to the n steps. And so it's exponential. The time cost is exponential. Um, so that's people say, well, that's an intractable algorithm or an inefficient algorithm. Now, it, that was not the practice, however. In practice, people found that it did a pretty good job. And then in the 70s, uh, some mathematicians came along and showed that on average, the time cost of simplex um, method was a degree four polynomial in problem size, which is quite manageable, which is quite nice. So, so uh, the concept of average complexity, average time is far more relevant for real life. Um, now, and uh, simplex method is available. Of course, the best software is Cplex and Gorobi. Um, there's a, a linear programming implementation in um, MATLAB, um, and I suspect elsewhere in other software. Um, but anyway, the, the gold standard is Cplex and Gorobi. And by the way, if you go to the Cplex or Gorobi websites, you might see initially that they cost something on the order of $10,000 to get, but that's a commercial price. They have an academic program where you can get it for free on your computer. Um, they like to check in every few months, I've heard, and check in that you're still an academic, that you haven't gone off to some um, financial firm um, which can pay the $10,000 or whatever the price is. But anyway, it is, it is available for academic work for free. And Carl, I believe, has some experience using it. Now, um, okay, so that's linear programming. Um, that's a simplex algorithm. I'll come back to linear programming later with the more modern algorithms. Now, I'm proceeding kind of in a, in a historical um, fashion here today. Now, here's the full-blown constrained nonlinear optimization problem. Again, the, um, here's a canonical problem written out and we're assuming everything is C2 on some domain X. Now, there's something called linear independence constraint qualification, LICQ. Now, this is a condition on the points X in the feasible domain. Now, suppose you're at, this is, this is um, for arbitrary point in X. You can talk about the set of active constraints. So now, of course, oh, this is, um, anyway, this notation is wrong. You, I'll you'll see better notation later. Now, the active set, of course, the equality constraints are always going to be active. If you're in the feasible region and, um, and a possible solution, then equality set, the, the uh, g of x is going to be equal to zero um, at any feasible point. So, and that's the, um, what I call e, the, the, fu the functions that, the equality constraints. Now, 
the typo here is that this should be HI. Um, so I'll make a note of this. Fix page eight. Now, so what we want to do is we know that all of the equality constraints at a solution are in the feasible domain. Um, all those are going to be active. Um, but now, when the inequality constraints, you see, some of these constraints are going to be active in the case that h sub i of x is equal to zero, but some are not going to be active. Some are going to be um, strict. You're going to have strict, and for some of the inequality constraints, you're going to have strict inequality. Um, now, what we care about, the, the thing is that basically at some point x, uh, if the h's aren't if the H's aren't, the ones that aren't active, you can toss them out and you haven't changed the problem, at least locally. So we care about the active constraints. Now, the linear independent constraint qualification holds at any point X, if and only if the gradients of all the active constraints are linearly independent. So we have the active constraints from equality, we have the active ones from the inequalities, and basically, each one of those functions have a gradient at x. And those gradients, in order for LICQ to hold, those gradients have to be all independent. Now, of course, by the way, the gradients are um, functions of, well, that everything here is a function of x. And if x has only n components, then um, what this says is that the gradients have to be, um, have to span um, they have to be linearly independent, and so they have to span a subset or a possible subset of Rn. Now, here's where the problem comes. Suppose that you have many, you see, by the way, there's no, you have equality constraints here. Now, by the way, it's, it's you don't want to have more equality constraints than you have variables. That's not a good idea. Um, so typically, your equality constraints, if X is Rn, the equality constraints um, are going to be, here we have M, and M is typically less than N. But now, the inequality constraints, you can have an enormous number of inequality constraints. The problem is, suppose you had are in 10 dimensions. X is 10 dimensional, and you have 100 constraints, and 20 of them are active. Well, then LICQ cannot hold because you have 20 gradients and you can't have 20 linearly independent gradients in a 10 dimensional space. So this, can, this problem can arise when you have um, more, a lot of inequality constraints more than uh, the number of choices. So that's a constraint um, at any point in the feasible set. But no, sorry, that's, that's a description of points in a feasible set. Um, we, aren't, we don't care, we don't want all points in the, in the feasible set to have this, this uh, linear constraint uh, qualification be true, but it is important that it be true at the solution. Here is the karish kuhn tucker theorem. Now, by the way, uh, if you just looked at the um, economics literature, you would say, well, what happened here? You've been taught the Kuhn-Tucker theorem. Well, I'll tell that story a little later, but this is the same theorem that you're used to calling Kuhn-Tucker. If there is a local minimum at X star, then there are multipliers. Lambda star are multipliers on the equality constraints. Mu star are the multipliers on the inequality constraints, such that X star is a stationary or critical point of the Lagrangian. What is the Lagrangian? Well, it's the objective function plus the uh, weighted sum of the equality constraints where the weights are the shadow prices um, or the multipliers, and then similar um, weighted sum of the inequality constraints uh, where the mu there are the weights. So then if you have a local minimum at X star, then um, the, this Lagrangian will be a stationary point, stationary point at X star. I'm not saying that it maximizes um, the Lagrangian. I'm just saying it's a stationary point. So that means that you have, um, when, you, when you differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to X, 
uh, you have basically the first order conditions being zero. Now, I'm not saying I'm not saying anything about this being a max or a min or whatever. It's just that this is uh, first order condition says that this combination of gradients has to add up to each one has to be zero. Um, then the other, but then also the thing is that the uh, the equality constraints have to hold, the inequality constraints have to hold at the solution. Now, the other, where we start to get um, more tied down is where, where more substance is that the shadow prices on the inequality constraints must be, will be positive, not non-negative. Furthermore, you have this property that for each constraint I, the product of the shadow price and the constraint will be zero. Now, if the constraint is not active, which means then that um, HI is less than or equal to zero. As you remember, the H is, well, H is supposed to be, by the way, be, you have to remember what the formulation here is. Minimize F subject to G equals zero and H less than or equal to zero. So it's minimize and H less than or equal to zero. When you have that form, then, and you do Kuhn Tucker, it says that there are these multipliers and all the mu's are non-negative. Furthermore, we have what we call a complementarity constraint that for each I, either the shadow price of a constraint is zero or the constraint itself is zero. Now, what this means is that if a constraint is not binding, so that a, the HI is positive, right? so it's not, oh no, sorry, 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 sorry. Suppose you have an HI that is strictly negative. It can't be positive, but suppose it's strictly negative. Well, in order for this product to be true, the mu has to be zero, but that makes sense. If a, if, if a constraint isn't active, then the shadow price should be zero. It, it doesn't matter, it's not important. If, however, the um, constraint is um, active, then this is going to be a zero, and then mu can be anything that it needs to be in order to satisfy other things. Um, and so you, you, have, you have this complementary condition, and then you have the repetition of the equality, inequality constraints, and then the mu's are all non-negative. Now, by the way, you have to be very careful in terms of using this theorem. This is when you formulate the problem in this fashion and it's a minimization problem then you get these uh, results now typically in economics maybe you're doing maximization or maybe you're doing the constraints have some inequality and equality constraints well then before you apply this theorem you have to be sure you get it into the form that we had where you have equality constraints and then all of your inequality constraints are less than or equal to zero. So you have to take some of the things that you want to have greater than or equal to zero, you have to like multiply minus one through them. And so you've got to convert everything into this form. And it's not H of X less than or equal to A or some number. You have to move everything to the left hand side and that's your constraint, uh, something is less than or equal to zero. So you have to get it into this form and then you get this result. Um, so anyway, that's uh, the thing to keep in mind here in applying this theorem. Now, if LICQ holds, then the multipliers are unique. Um, but if they don't hold, then you have a possible, the, the other possibility is that you have multiple solutions to, for the lambdas, um, and but the mathematical expression is that the the um, multipliers are unbounded. That doesn't mean that any of it doesn't mean that some of them are infinity. It just means that the set of them is uh, not finite, um, and so that's now the terminology that's used now. Um, okay, but oh. Oops. So that's the KKT theorem. Now, a little background here. Um, uh, yes, you were taught it was a Kuhn-Tucker theorem. 
And then in the, in the early 70s, Kuhn became aware of the fact that this guy Karish um, had already proven the Kuhn-Tucker theorem in his um, master's thesis written at the University of Chicago, I believe roughly 1939, 1940, something like that. And so then Kuhn um, said, well, we gotta, should give him credit for this. They, they were independent discoveries. Um, and so now in the math programming literature, it's always Karish Kuhn Tucker. In math, in, in mathematical economics books, it's still only Kuhn Tucker. And I like to point to that because that, that is kind of a time when, even though economists used to interact a lot with the operations research people and the optimization theory people in the 50s and 60s, they, those communities grew apart. And so at about the same time that this happened, and so in economics, you only hear Kuhn Tucker because uh, the economists have kind of diverged um, from interacting with the computational math people. And so they haven't adjusted yet to um, using the same phrase as in um, uh, the math literature, Karish Kuhn Tucker. And by the way, the proper pronunciation is Karish, not Karush, not something else, Karish. Um, Dick Cottle wrote a nice paper, I think, be, remind me to make sure to post it on the website, uh, describing all this history, and in particular describing what he did to find out that um, the proper pronunciation is Karish. Um, so now the other thing that if you look at um, math econ textbooks, and in particular, there's one that was published uh, just, I don't know, about 10 years ago or something by Corbet and Stinchcomb and Weber, I think, anyway. Um, and there they describe the, what they call the Kuhn-Tucker theorem, and they talk about linear independent constraint qualification. And then they basically say that in economics, we ignore the linear independent constraint qualification um, because in order for it to be to fail, um, you have to look at problems that are perverse. Well, you're looking at a pervert right now because I, uh, oh, what, 15 years ago, started working on a problem where there was massive failure of LICQ. Uh, this was an optimal tax paper um, that I started, project I started with Che Lin Su um, back in 2005. Um, and um, we ran into massive failures with LICQ. Um, I'm gonna put that papers, that will make those papers available to you too. We. Um, with the help of some uh, applied mathematicians, um, I, with, their, with their help, I now know how to solve these problems. You can get around LICQ. If LICQ fails, then in the math literature, those problems are called degenerate. So I'm a degenerate. Okay, fine. Um, and, but now we can solve those degenerate problems. Um, now, now, for standard, simple, basic economics, you know, supply, demand, uh, equilibrium kinds of problems, it's true that LICQ is probably going to hold automatically. It's, you don't worry about it. Uh, when you go into the field, in any in sort of incentive contract kind of context, and you go beyond the simple one-dimensional type heterogeneity stuff, you are going to run into failure of LICQ. Um, so that's why we ran into it. Um, now, so let me rewrite, here are the KKT conditions. Um, the gradient of Lagrangian with respect to X is zero, and that just means that the gradient of the, um, also, by the way, the other thing you gotta take note of, oops, did I get this right? Oh, I might've gotten this wrong. This maybe should be minus signs here, anyway. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, okay. Because if it was, then you, I'll, I'll let me fix all that up. Um, I used to write things out in terms of maximization and then now I'm converting to the minimization stuff. So um, I have to fix this. But anyway, because I think that should have been minus in order to get this, that the gradient of the, the gradient of the objective is a sum of the, um, weighted some of the gradients of the constraints. 
Anyway, so I've got to fix this up. Um, but the key thing here is that you've got equality constraints um, and then, okay, this is a different indexing. Sorry, sorry. This is where, yeah, sorry. Um, anyway, this needs to be cleaned up, sorry. Um, so the key thing is that um, you have active constraints and inactive constraints, and LICQ just says that the, uh, the active constraints, gradients, have to be linearly independent. Okay, so that's the theory. Um, now, with that theory, how do we come up with um, uh, methods for doing this? Now, one approach is kind of the brain dead idea of, well, you don't know which inequality constraints are going to be active, which ones aren't. So what you do is you pick some, you assume that they are active, and then if they're active, then that means that they are, can be thought of as equality constraints. And so then the first order conditions is just this, uh, this sum of this set of equations. So you just solve this, these equations. Or you find a special solver that deals particularly with um, equality constraint problems. Okay, so. Um, so for each, you, for, here's a set of all inequality constraints, one to L. And then you take a subset of those called P and then a cal cal calligraphy P. And then, and then for that problem, you solve it. Now, some of these equations will not have solutions because it may, it may not make sense for it, um, a certain pair of, e of constraints to both be active. So you find, you find the ones that have solutions and then you take the best. Okay, that's, um, and then of course, the thing is that when you find something that is a solution, you've got to check that the constraints that were left out of uh, calligraphy P are, about are, are satisfied. Okay, so this is sort of brain dead Kuhn Tucker approach. Um, uh, now, of course, the problem is that if you have L constraints and the number of such subproblems is two to the L. So uh, this has, for large L, this is um, not a good idea. But it it has a, a, it has some value to it. And because you say, well, gee, if I could just focus on the problems where the act where I just focus on the active constraint, maybe that's going to make things simpler. And that's kind of what some of these methods do. Um, not this one, but um, others. Okay, the first method for solving constrained optimization problems that was discussed at all um, was the penalty function approach. So you see, at this time, we now know how to solve unconstrained optimization problems. That was a lecture last Thursday. So one thing to do is to convert the constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained problem. How do we do that? Well, we take this canonical problem with various uh, equality constraints and inequality constraints, and what we do is we construct a penalty function. So basically, think about the equality constraints. G of x equals a. So what we want is some x such that each component of x equals the corresponding component of a. So what we do is we loosen things up. We say, okay, you can take, you can look at x's such that gi, x, gi of x does not equal ai, but I'm going to penalize you for choosing something that's too far away from satisfying the constraint. And here's, the, here's that constraint. So um, we, we allow the computer to look at x's that don't satisfy this exactly, this uh, equality constraint exactly. But then we look at the error, the deviation, and then we square it. And you, you add that up for all of the um, equality constraints and their errors. And so you get a sum of quadratic um, errors. Okay, so. Um, that you, you, what you've done is you've relaxed the problem. This is what's called a relaxation. Um, so things that were not allowed here are allowed here.
And then now what are inequality constraints? Well, you see the equality constraints, you don't, you don't want G of X to be anything other than A. You don't want it to be bigger than A. You don't want it to be less than A. And so this is a two-sided quadratic penalty. Now, with inequality constraints, you don't mind if H of X is a lot less than B. You just don't want it to be bigger. So you only put in a one-sided quadratic um, penalty. So basically you take h minus hj minus bj and now if that is negative well that's fine with you if b is bigger than h that's fine um but then if h is okay so no, if h is less yeah if h minus b is negative that means h is less than b and that's fine you're happy now if h is bigger than b then this is a positive number and now you care about it. So basically you take max of zero plus whatever the gap here is and then square that. So that's a one-sided penalty. Now then, yeah, you say, okay, I can do this. And, but now you say, well, gee, if I just did this, um, how good is it gonna be? Well, here's your tuning parameter, um, P, penalty. And so now the thing is that as P gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it's more painful for the computer to make deviations from the constraints. So P is a penalty parameter. And then um, the, so we, for given any value of P, we have an unconstrained problem. Okay, given fix P and this is an unconstrained problem optimizing over x, and then you have your a and b as parameters. Um, now, if p is infinite in some sense, then basically that's the same as the inequality constraint problem. Um, but hopefully what, for p that's sufficiently big, um, you'll be close to the solution. Um, uh, this reminds me when I was an uh, undergraduate, I participated in one of these psych experiments, and um, basically I was this early 70s and so as somebody deviated from what they were told to do I was supposed to turn up some some dial that represented supposedly some um, pain that was being inflicted on the other participant in this um, who wasn't behaving of course the whole thing was rigged there was no pain on the other part the other the other person was a colleague of the tester but anyway so uh, those things I don't think those experiments are allowed anymore but anyway, that's what you want to do. Increase the pain so that the computer will then focus in on what's the relevant area to get close to the solution. The problem is, if you have P be a very large number, the Hessian of this objective function of the penalized problem is going to be very ill-conditioned. Not surprising because you've got you've got p multiply this sum of squares and whatever the condition number is for this by itself, you then you got multiplied by p. So it's gonna be very ill conditioned. But okay, take that as as a fact. Um, but now what we could do is we could well, the idea of a penalty method is to pick some small choice of the penalty p1. And then you get a first solution. And then you just keep going round and round. Um, um, you, you come up with X1 is now your next guess. So but generally, if you're at the XK guess, uh, then you uh, solve. Now, XK had some, was, came when you had a penalty parameter of PK. Then you increase the penalty parameter and then use XK as the initial guess for the K plus 1 problem. Because if it was, if the solution, see the solution to the K problem is probably going to have not too bad a Hessian when you plug it into the K plus one problem. Okay. So you keep going. Um, one nice thing about the um, penalty method is that the shadow prices have very simple relationship to the um, little a and little b. Now, um, theorem the pure math theorem is that the penalty function method will work, will converge um, as the penalty goes up and up. 
Um, and here's a little example, consumption example, simple, basic, uh, good Y and good Z and income, square root utility function. And so we know what the solution is. Lambda star here is a shadow price on the budget. Um, but we put it in this penalty function approach. And then we start with a penalty equal to 10 and then 100 and 1,000, et cetera. And what you see is that, um, you know, the solution is five has a five force. And this is, I report here, the error. And you see that the error is, um, you know, you have three digit accuracy when you had a penalty of 100, four digit a penalty of 1,000, but then things stagnate. This is because you're using finite precision arithmetic. Now, if you had infinite, you had higher precision arithmetic, then this would still stagnate, but at a higher, at a larger penalty. Um, now, so I'm showing you these the, the, these ideas, the Kuhn Tucker method approach and the penalty thing. There's both of them have some value, some intuitive value, but on their own, things aren't going to work too well. Okay, but now we're going to start using those ideas, but applying them in a judicious fashion. Now, I'm not going to get into this, but um, there, there are special methods for quadratic problems. Let's say you have a quadratic objective and linear constraints. So this is a quadratic programming problem. It's a very well-researched um, area. Um, uh, so it's kind of an extension of linear programming in some sense. Um, anyway, there's lots of good software and algorithms for solving quadratic programming problems. Quadratic objective, linear constraints. So, and again, that's actually part of CPLEX and Garobi to, to do that. Um, and other software. So I'm not going to go into the details of uh, what are good methods for doing this. But I'm just saying this is a problem. This is the kind of problem which is relatively easy to solve. We're going to take advantage of that. We're going to use it to create the sequential quadratic programming method. Now, some of you may have heard me make comments about economists um, not knowing much about numerical analysis. So here's, I'm going to make a point that the first person to write about sequential quadratic programming uh, was Bob Wilson in his 1964, I think, PhD thesis at Harvard in the Applied Math Department. Okay, so um, Bob Wilson was a major contributor to this uh, literature and is always cited in terms of whenever it does a history of, of the sequential quadratic programming method. Um, I think his initial problem was to, his initial thing was to do it when you had a, a convex problem, but no, the idea was, was this sequential quadratic programming method. Now, so we know that the solution of any um, optimization problem is a stationary point of Lagrangian. Now, suppose, but the problem is that we don't know which H constraints are active. Suppose that we have current set of guesses. We have a current set of guesses for XK. We also have current set of guesses for the, the shadow prices. Now, what you do is you then replace the quadratic objective, the Lagrangian, replace the quadratic objective. Um, that they replace the nonlinear objective with a quadratic approximation. So this is a quadratic approximation of the Lagrangian based at the, the most recent guess of x, lambda, and mu. And this is, here's your linear term and here's your quadratic term. So you have a quadratic objective. And then at the equality, cons at xk, at the, um, for the equality constraints, you, you produce a linear approximation of, the, of G, the G equality constraints at the most recent solution. 
And then also you replace the nonlinear constraints with a linear approximation. And so now what you want to do is min you minimize over S. S is basically the step you're going to take. Or the, or the direct or the search direction. So um, you want to, first of all, you think of S as a step. So you want to find that step, which minimizes this quadratic problem with linear constraints. And that you then send off to some quadratic programming software, and it does that, comes up with an answer. So your next iterate is going to be the old iterate. You could just take the next step, but what you also want to do is do a, um, a search direction. So take SK as a search direction. Um, okay, there's something else called trust region. I'm just going to talk about search line search here because we talked about it last time. So basically the SK that you SK plus one that comes out of this problem is used as a search direction. So then you minimize in that uh, you, you minimize in that one dimensional um, direction. So and then so you have a new XK. So then now you update. I'm not going to describe the update formulas for Lambda and U. They're a mess. Um, but the key thing here is that you have taken this nonlinear objective function with nonlinear equality and nonlinear inequality constraints and locally replace it with a quadratic programming problem. And that is SQP. Um, and then you iterate. You have, you, know, you have XK and you go to XK plus one, etc. The nice thing about SQP is that it has a lot of the nice properties of Newton's method. Convergence is rather rapid. Also, we talked, I talked a lot, uh, last week about how the Hessians here may be uh, very com computationally expensive. Well, you can then use uh, quasi-Newton methods to approximate the Hessians. So SQP is uh, a natural um, uh, development of, of Newton's method to um, constraint optimization. Um, now, the other thing I should point out is that uh, um, the SQP is um, the underlying algorithm in the Stanford solvers, NPSOL and SNOPT. Um, some of you may have experience in accessing it through MATLAB and TomLab. Others may have access to it in other ways, but that's a, those are SQP. Uh, the, the algorithm in those are SQPs. Um, I don't know exactly, it's been a while since I've really dug into FMIN um, F min con, um, my, at least at one time I looked and I, it looked like it was an SQP. Um, so maybe you could like, if you see, the thing is this, that one, you should kind of understand what an algorithm is that whatever software you're using, you should understand the algorithm that's being used. And so I'm teaching you some of the buzzwords, SQP, search direction, all this kind of stuff. And so that you can recognize them when you look at the documentation of some software. Um, so, um, that, so you have some understanding of what, um, of what's going on. Um, so uh, SQP is, uh, is a very well developed method and it's present in a lot of software. Now, um, unfortunately, I don't think there is a version of SQP in the public domain. Um, that I know of. If somebody finds a version of SQP in the public domain, tell me about it, share it with everybody. Um, now, I'm going to come back to domain problems. I mentioned that earlier, it just comes up even more so in, in constrained optimization. Is that suppose you did take a, just did a penalty function approach. Well, the thing is that you know, you, you take down, you had your objective, you have your equality constraints, your inequality constraints, you write down some penalty function business. But then the thing is that X may not be defined everywhere. 
there may be some places where the f, f, some x's where f of x is not defined, you know, like log utility, but with negative consumption, a variety of things where, so that is not defined. And that happens all the time with consumption, with, with uh, you know, uh, utility maximization and log utility, power utility, et cetera. Um, so for example, if you took any of these things, you're gonna have problems. Um, unless you be careful now. So I talked about last time when we talked about this, these domain issues, I said you, you could transform the variables. That's something that uh, economists um, do um, uh, in, um, intuitively. Okay, I just got from Bart. Oh, okay, I guess to everybody, FMinCon can use SQP. Ah, okay. But you have to tell it. Good. This, this is a newer version of SUP than Vetman Common. So, by the way, this is always the case with any software. Um, the software, often many software um, packages, um, have multiple options. Vetman Con has two options: SQP and Interior Point. Something I'll talk about later. Um, but you should know what those options are. Um, don't just automatically do the default. Um, know what the options are because, by the way, there are pluses and minuses to both SQP and FBIN and, and Interior Point. Okay, so I'll not do those comparisons later. So they, you need to know what is available um, in the software. So, for example, Nitro is known primarily I think for being an interior point solver, but it has SQP as an option. So um, the software pr providers are putting in more and more modern um, uh, methods into their software, but then you need to know what method they're using. And so, uh, okay, so that's information about FMinCon. Um, do uh, both. Now, you, uh, okay, getting back to domain issues. Um, you can transform variables, alter objectives. Now, the thing is that I've talked about that. You take the log utility function, but then change it for uh, when the log function is close to zero, and then so that's globally concave. Um, now, here's the thing you can try doing in your software. So suppose if your utility function is log x plus log y, then you could add constraints to constraint optimization saying that you want X and Y to both be positive. By the way, don't just say, you see, by the way, in, you have to give it some positive lower bound. See, now in, in economics, you might say, well, X and Y, you want them to be greater than zero. The computer does not understand strict equal strict inequalities. That's an open interval. Um, so the only thing a computer really understands and will obey is if you give it a closed set definition. X is greater than or equal to zero is what you have to write down. But then that's not good because you don't want X to be zero if you have if you're going to evaluate log X. So you choose some delta. So that X is strictly bigger than delta, in this case, Y bigger than delta. Now, um, you know, 10 to the minus six is probably good enough. But then you add that as a constraint. But that may not solve, that may, that may not make things work. That may not avoid the domain problem. And here's something you gotta keep in mind is that the these pa optimization packages are designed to give you a solution which satisfies all of your requests. The maximizing the objective subject to the constraints and the solution has to satisfy the constraints. So it's designed to give you as the final answer uh, something that satisfies all the constraints. However, as far as the evolution of an algorithm, as far as the iteration of the algorithm is concerned, it may not feel obligated to keep X strictly bigger than delta. Uh, 
it may still jump off, take a Newton step and jump off into X being negative or uh, Y being negative. So um, putting in these constraints um, will not necessarily solve the domain problem. Whether or not it solves the domain problem depends very much on your software. Um, some software will accept what we call hard constraints. And a hard constraint is where not only will the solution satisfy the constraint, but every iterate will also satisfy the constraint. Um, and, uh, um, but the, otherwise the constraints are going to be dealt with in a loose fashion. So if you have software that can, can, uh, where you can tell it to have hard constraints, then that, is very good software. Now, by the way, if you use um, Ample or GAMS and you access uh, the Stanford solvers, then you can do hard constraints. Um, by the way, I think the only thing you really can do is hard constraints for linear constraints, but that's typically what, what that's adequate actually. So, um, so that's uh, what you uh, need to do. You have to, the domain problem, See, the domain problem comes up all the time in economics because we have log utility function. We take square root of uh, utility. We have all law. We have all these functions that are not defined everywhere. This is not so much of a problem in uh, engineering, physics, etc. So this is a major headache unless you're careful about constructing the problem and um, uh, dealing with it and being aware of it. By the way, having a good initial guess will, will avoid these problems, but uh, finding good initial guesses is, of course, an art. So, um, so anyway, the thing, uh, you have to um, know how, what exactly your solver can do um, in terms of um, hard constraints versus soft constraints. Um, and in order to avoid these issues. So this is something you just have to be aware of and be careful of. Maybe you write down the problem, you have a good initial guess, no problems. But um, I'm not here to tell you how to, that say, oh, if you have a good initial guess, then you don't have to worry about these things. I'm here to tell you what can go wrong and how to recover it. That's the value of uh, this course. Now, um, okay. Now, uh, so we saw how we could take the, quad, the quadratic programming um, software that's available, the special tools of quadratic programming, and then use it in an iterative fashion to solve nonlinear optimization of, with nonlinear constraints. Now, let's go back to the Kuhn Tucker approach, where you look at all possible combinations of uh, binding and uh, not binding uh, inequality constraints. Now, there's too many. Too many possibilities. Um, but, um, but perhaps we can make judicious choices as to which constraints are active and which ones aren't. And so that's what active set methods do. So, um, so basically with active set methods, you, um, oh, this should be KKT, sorry, ancient slide. Um, uh, so what we want to do is um, start with some set of uh, guesses for what constraints are active and what ones aren't. Perhaps we just get rid of all of the inequality constraints, see what happens. Um, so, but for that initial set of constraints, we see what the solution is. And then, by the way, if uh, the solution of this thing satisfies all the constraints we left out, well, we're done. That was nice. That was short. But more typically, some of the constraints we left out in defining the P problem uh, will be violated. And so the thing is that we will we'll say, well, we've got to include them and then throw them into this uh, set P and then iterate. Now, by the way, the problem is we keep throwing in anything that was violated the last round that the set could explode in size. Um, so what happens is that 
as the as the piece head is getting bigger, we look at some constraints that aren't active or, and are basically far from being active, and you toss, toss, throw them out, and then um, and you know, increase. Th this is like thinking about the penalty function method, increase penalty parameter, et cetera. But it, you just um, you repeat that. So you make a guess for which constraints are binding or active, solve that problem, and then see if that solution violates some of the constraints that were left out. If that is the case, throw the, the violated constraints into this set and then redo this, um, and occasionally then throwing out things that seem redundant. Um, now, by the way, the simplex method that we talk about is really an active set method because what you're doing as you're going from vertex to vertex, you're saying, okay, what constraints are binding right here? And then uh, which edge do I go down in order to speed up to go fastest in terms of attaining my objective? So, um, now, by the way, this is an active set method. Um, of course, um, this active set idea could be used in conjunction with um, SQP because now when, it, when we make some guess about uh, what constraints are active, we then have a nonlinear um, constraint optimization problem and then we could apply SQP to that smaller problem. So uh, active set and SQP are I, I think basically they're natural uh, partners in all of this. Um, so um, those are the SQP um, is um, very important algorithm uh, and then combine it with active set it becomes uh, pretty good. Um, now to bring you up to date though I'm going to talk about interior point methods. Um, interior point methods are, well, first of all, I'm going to give you a formulation that just relies on the first order conditions, KKT conditions. Um, but then I'll, the next thing I'll talk about is the logarithmic barrier approach, which is a penalty function kind of idea. Now, Interior point methods. Go back to linear, we're going back to linear programming problems now. Minimize uh, the weighted sum of X components subject to equality constraints and non-negativity on X. Now, if you write down the Kuhn Tucker condition, the KKT conditions for this, you'll find that um, you end up with this problem. First of all, you know, the thing is that you have some, ine when you write down the KKT, you have some inequalities, but then you put in slack variables of the and you impose the sign restrictions on that, and you end up with this system of equations for the X, also the shadow price lambda, um, and then also for the slack variables. This is a nonlinear system. Of, well, this part is a nonlinear system of equations, and then this is basically non-negative constraints. So what is the idea of interior, this? So those are the, so those equations, this, this is the first order condition. Now, by the way, notice that um, this is a, um, this first equation is a linear, the unknowns are lambda and s, and, other, and it's linear in that. This is a linear expression. This, is, this, this equation is linear in X. This is not linear. This, at both XI and SI are unknown, and so this is a quadratic uh, condition. But notice, by the way, that this, this uh, has a kind of a nice, simple structure. Um, it is a nonlinear system of equations, but uh, modest nonlinearity. So, what the interior point, one way to motivate interior point methods is to take those first order conditions and perturb, or the KKT conditions, and perturb them a bit. So now what we're going to do is the perturbation parameter is mu. 
So instead of saying xi times si has to equal zero, we're going to say, well, let's have them equal some, po some small positive scalar, some po small positive number. And by the way, this is the same small positive number for each i. Now, uh, so you perturb that. Now, of course, what we, and then also you put in these equality, these inequality constraints. Now, what interior point methods do is, um, see, for a fixed mu, uh, by the way, the, this piece of this system of nonlinear equations, okay, I say it's simple, it's just quadratic. But however, remember that at the solution, either S is zero or X is zero, which means the Jacobian is going to have a lot of, it's going to have zero rows. You can't just send this off to a nonlinear equation solver because then the Jacobian is not going to be well behaved. So you can't, you can't do that. You can't do what seems like an obvious thing to do because no, that this is, this, um, this by itself is not a well formed, is not a system you can solve. So now when you put in the slightly positive number here, now this system is going, by the way, at the solution, X and S are not going to be equal to zero. Um, both are going to be strictly positive. And so now then the Jacobian of this system is uh, not singular. I mean, unless you have some other degeneracies. So with interior point, what you do is you pick, you pick a mu, then you solve this system of, of, nonlinear equations. And again, the very special structure of this means that you have very special methods that can be used to do this efficiently. Now, then you iterate. You find, you make a, you first use a uh, not so small mu, you get some uh, solution. Now then you check that the X and S that comes out satisfy these inequality conditions. Um, um, and if they don't, then there's, um, then you have to go to what's called path falling methods, uh, which is something that, um, uh, Philip will talk to you about when he talks about, um, homotopy methods. Um, but basically suppose, that, let's ignore this little detail now. So you, you basically take a mu, solve out for X and S, and then that X and S is the initial guess for the next problem where you reduce mu. So for every mu, you get some, for a different mu, you get an xk, lambda k, sk. And um, then as mu goes to zero, uh, these x's and lambdas will converge to the solution of the, of the problem you really care about. So the set of solutions of the perturbed system, x mu, lambda mu, s mu, is called the central path. And it's a, you, you, um, if you were in X lambda and S space, you would see that this goes um, in, write the picture, draw the picture correctly. It's a central path. It's a path that goes into um, the solution. Lots of details. It's often difficult to find a good initial guess. And you can't, see, this is a disadvantage of interior point. Um, the basic interior point methods um, you do, 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 may blow up if you give it a really good initial guess. Um, and that's because uh, these equations um, are ill-conditioned if, if your lambda x's and s's aren't um, just right. And so um, it's much harder to use uh, good initial guesses. Now, there is some software, IPOP, that does appear to be able to use good initial guesses. I have to study exactly why it can, but in general, interior point methods are not good with that in initial guess. IPOP, will, by the way, IPOP is in the public domain. So IPOP, uh, um, it used to be an, an IBM project. And in those days, it was awful. Um, yes, they would give you this, the, so they would give you the software for free, or most of it for free. But then the, the make files were very buggy. I had a student many years ago um, 
tried to use IP up and um, he said, told me the make files were full of bugs. And also the thing is, even if you had that, you then had to go get some uh, special linear program, linear algebra package, which was not in the public domain. But now what happened is that uh, um, there's a guy named Vachter who's behind it. He's, in the, he's now a professor at Northwestern. So there's a person to talk to and he's, he's receptive to uh, comments. And um, so it's, much, it's a much better piece of software now. Um, and it will use good initial guesses and it's in the public domain. Um, so, but that's one of the downsides of most interior point implementations. Now, I don't, this is something to check out. Does Fmin Khan with interior point uh, make good use of good initial guesses? Um, that's something to check out. Um, now, perhaps F, perhaps MathWorks actually bought a license or, or got permission from IPOPT to, um, to, to put that into their software. That's something to check out, go digging down into the documentation of of FMIN Khan, perhaps it is IP opt, but we don't know. Now, by the way, Mathematica does have IP opt as a uh, optimization of, of, uh, um, alternative. So, um, yeah, those are the things to check out. Um, IP opt would be very good. Other linear, other interior point methods um, may be more problematic in terms of using good initial guesses. Um, okay, so. Here's the other thing about interior point methods is that the theory says that as mu goes to zero, you will converge to the solution of the original problem. But notice that every, for every mu that's not equal to zero, the x and the s, in particular the x, is strictly positive. Um, and by the way, what, where, okay, what this also means, okay, now this is in linear programming. Um, so the point here is that the interior point method will never tell you that, that X at the solution is equal to zero. This is one of the downsides of interior point methods that, um, you, when you look at the results, you may see that no constraint is active, which may puzzle you. Um, but then when you look at the constraint violations, they may be numbers like 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8. Um, the problem here is that you have only double precision arithmetic. Um, the mu parameter can be driven only so close to, to zero, it can't get really close to zero. And so what that means is that with interior point methods, your so-called solution is still gonna be interior to the problem domain. And it'd be very hard to identify which constraints are active. Now, what I recommend is that you, I mean, you use interior point, but then once you have found a solution, um, use that as an initial guess into an SQP uh, because SQP can handle, will handle um, uh, a good initial guesses very well and so it should then uh, quickly um, uh, converge to the true solution and then also identify which constraints are active and which ones aren't. So that's always a headache whenever I use interior point methods is finding out which constraints are active uh, is some, requires some post-processing. Um, so that's a downside of interior point. Um, um, now you might ask, what's the upside? Well, interior point, in linear programming, interior point has, is, is not, does not suffer from the Chris dimensionality. So, that's the upside. So for linear programming, if you have a sufficiently large problem, interior point will do better than simplex. Um, 
How big that problem has to be, I don't know. It has to be really big because what's happened over time is that when the interior point methods became available and developed in the 80s and 90s, then the people behind CPLEX, um, who by the way were then the same people that are now behind Garobi, um, they, you know, they got the competitive uh, itch going and so they refined, the simplex people refined the simplex algorithm and so uh, if you have CPLEX, I believe CPLEX gives you both options um, nowadays, in, um, or Groby, well, simplex, uh, gives simplex versus interior point and so there have been massive improvement in simplex methods and so it's, it's a, uh, it's a horse race between the two for any problem other than some enormous problem. So um, now I'm going to finish today with the logarithmic barrier problem and a method. And I'm going to show it only for nonlinear optimization with inequality constraint, just to keep the notational um, burden down. So we have minimize f of x subject to the gi functions being non-positive uh, or non-negative from being non-negative. Now, what's the idea here? The idea is to create something like a penalty function, but different. You see, g the gi function is is never supposed to be negative. Um. So what we do now is we put in what's called a barrier function. What we do is, so, so this set, this feasible set has a boundary where um, the, some of the GIs are equal to zero. That's the boundary of the feasible region. Now what we're going to do, now the solution may, the solution may, be on the boundary where some GIs are binding and some aren't. But what we're going to do now is create a barrier function. So we're going to make it painful for the computer to even get close to the, the boundary. So basically what's going to happen is you have this penalty function where what you do is you take the log, you take each of these GIs, you take its logarithm, logarithm you add up the logarithms, and then uh, you multiply by some penalty parameter mu and then you subtract it from the objective. Now, why is there subtraction here? Because, well, when the GIs are small and close to zero, this is going to be a large negative number. And so what you want to do is um, have, essentially minimizing, you want this to be uh, this total thing that increase the objective. Okay. So the mu is the barrier parameter the log, um, the sum of the log GIs are the uh, logarithmic barrier function. So now the thing is, let the computer roam around, but make it infinitely painful to touch the boundary. Um, now, by the way, okay, I've by the way, I've written this in probably a non-traditional fashion. What I'm, I wrote it is that so now then, as you solve this problem for a positive mu. And then you get that solution, and then you um, find something and then use that as initial guess, but now you reduce mu down to zero. Um, uh, some, I think the more common way of writing this is one over mu, and then you, this term is one over mu, and then you take mu off to infinity, like you would take a penalty function off to infinity. Okay, so so the idea is that in this case, as Basically, as the as this piece, this logarithmic barrier piece, is squeezed down in magnitude, then you will converge to uh, the the solution of this problem. That's a logarithmic barrier method. And here are the first order conditions um, and uh, some other rewriting of it. And so, what you have is that um, in the logarithmic barrier function for a given mu, you have this nonlinear system of equations um, that need to be solved. Now, um, now by the way, log, there's a lot of connections between logarithmic barrier function and um, interior point methods. Um, 
So it's natural to talk about these together. And by the way, also with logarithmic barrier methods is that you're not, you know, you're not really going to have any of the GI um, inequality constraints be active. So, um, um, now, so that's the downside of these methods um, is that you're not going to be able to identify perfectly what constraints are active. Um, however, they have speed advantages. And so maybe sometimes, and so you use their speed and then take their answer, take it over to SQP, which is locally very good. Um, so you think about this, I think these, these methods are probably better in a global sense um, than SQP. Um, these methods are very, if you have a convex optimization problem, convex minimization problem, interior point is a dominant way to go. Now, by the way, there are generalizations of what I've shown you um, for interior point methods to, to nonlinear optimization, as uh, we saw with Ekman Khan. Now, um, the, now I, like I said, I used to be kind of a, not care much for interior point methods. I tend to prefer SQP. But then uh, go back to this uh, optimal tax problem. Um, which, and which I'll, the, the papers I'll post. Um, what the what happened was that when when I started talking with these mathematicians, in particular uh, Michael Saunders and a student of his and a friend of his also, um, what we found was that, or what Michael and his buddies found, was that interior point was the way to go. Now, this optimal tax problem that we had, you had some, you know, maximize some of utility subject to incentive compatibility constraints. We had like half a million compatibility constraints. And even though we only had like about a thousand choice variables, uh, so we had massive failures of LICQ. We had enormously larger number of active constraints than we had choice variables. So there's no chance that LICQ was gonna work. Um, then what he tell, told me is that active set methods would never be able to work because you've got half a million constraints and it's trying to find a combination that satisfies the problem. But then you've got LACQ going, um, fighting against you. So then what they did is they chose to go interior point. Now interior point by itself didn't work. And so then they had, they combined it with augmented Lagrangian, which is an older approach to constrained optimization. Um, so that was the, uh, how we got that. Now, the critical thing that helped in terms of interior point that helped us was that um, the constraints, or maybe half a million constraints, but the Jacobian of the constraints is extremely sparse. You may have half a million rows, but each row in the Jacobian matrix had only four elements. And so then um, that feature was used by the interior point solver. And, um, and so we were able to solve those problems. And nice. The, uh, I like how competitive these guys are. So when Saunders got this to work and he used IP opt to get it to work, he then, uh, called up the Nitro people and said, well, we've got this thing working with IP op, but we couldn't get Nitro to work. And then it was a few weeks later, the Nitro guy came back and said, well, we got Nitro to work and it's even faster than IP opt. And of course, what makes this all even more amusing is that uh, the main Nitro guy is a professor at Northwestern, as is the main IP op guy. So um, you kind of stimulate the competitive juices and yeah, the result is, you that science. Um, so, okay, so what have I done? I have given you a very quick, shallow, many mathematicians would say very shallow, but overview of um, these optimization methods um, and hopefully told you about some of the buzzwords that you're going to want to watch out for um, um, in terms of uh, when you're looking at the documentation of software.
the key lesson here, though, one key lesson is um, interior points have, methods have their advantage. SQP has advantages, their complementary advantages. Basically, whatever your problem is, try both. And that with interior point methods, uh, it, it's harder to identify exactly what constraints are active, so you can use them in a partnership. Um, so uh, now, one more historical note. Interior point methods really exploded in the 1980s. By interior point methods, I also I mean all of the various varieties of it. Um, now, the logarithmic barrier function method, this or some very similar version of this, was actually first proposed by Ragnar Frisch, an economist, in the 1950s. Um, nothing happened. I mean, there was there, nothing, there was no progress at that point made on this. Why? Number one, they had single precision arithmetic in computers, not double precision. And the linear algebra with interior point methods or the logarithmic barrier method, uh, the linear algebra um, needs at least double precision arithmetic to work because the matrices are, have, don't have low condition numbers. The other thing was that in the mid 1950s, they didn't even have good uh, linear algebra software. But it's only then in the 60s that they developed very good, high quality suites of linear programming, uh, linear algebra, things like matrix inversion, so solving linear equations, and things like that. And then by the 80s, um, double precision became the default architecture of CPUs. And then interior point methods and logarithmic barrier methods, they became feasible um, to implement hardware progress and software progress. But when you look at history of papers on the history of interior point methods, they cite Ragnar Frisch, and then there's a couple other guys from the 50s also as being first in terms of the idea. But they were too early. There wasn't the software backup, and there wasn't hardware that could use those ideas at that time. Okay, so uh, let this be the official end of today's lecture. Any questions? Any comments?